Hey guys, want to welcome you again to the Three Circle Podcast Beyond the Weekend. This is where we go beyond what we talk about on the weekend. And we right now are in the middle of a series called Tumbleweed. Really glad all of you are joining us today. My name's Chris Bell and I'm a part of the ministerial team here at Three Circle. And I've got an awesome guest with us today to discuss tumbleweed and many other things. He has been a part of our team now for, I don't know, about eight years, seven, I think. Seven, seven, I think right seven, seven years. Or seven in September. Seven in September. That's unbelievable. Um, he was the Daphne campus pastor. He's a part of our teaching team. And now he is the campus pastor for our Thomasville campus. It's it's a pretty amazing story. We're really glad to have him here today. Great leader, serious theologian. Awesome communicator. Good to have my buddy, Nick Williams. Well, it's good to be here. I, you, know, you never know when you're going to get asked to be on one of these things being two hours away. So yeah. Well, we made it happen. And, it, and we keep going. we got to get Nick on here. And I was like, today's the day. I'm here. We're getting it in the tank. Hey, it's great to have you here. I know that, uh, so people may not know this, but uh, you're actually my brother-in-law. Yeah. And so what a we, blessing for you. Huh? <laughs> a, I didn't choose this. Um, it's an but, arranged marriage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely um but you know so your story is amazing though and and so we're going to get into tumbleweed in a minute but i think people want to hear your story a little yeah. bit so what's incredible is you went to the you're from thomasville right. thomasville is your hometown you were you know football star all of that there or allegedly what they call us. Yeah, yeah allegedly <laughs> throw the ball over those mountains yeah right um you were running back right running back linebacker very average, safety. very, very average, average you're looking running at back. average running back average linebacker <laughs> So absolutely. So you go to the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, and and you graduated there. You and my wife, sister Deanna, got married. You're living in Tuscaloosa, and you had an unbelievable job and yeah, situation. Loved it in the construction world, yep. and really had a path, you know, pretty much paved way on down the line. Yeah. Right, you yeah. can see it. Plan on retiring there. <laughs> yeah, you did, and then God called you. Yeah. To ministry, and you're one of those guys, and I've always respected your story, very much like the disciples leaving their nets at the shore. Right. You just you just pulled up and left, man. Yeah. Left town, went back to your hometown. That must have been a. I mean, I know that you had such clarity, but yeah. it must have been hard. At it's the same t- time. it was tough because we were we were leaving a place we'd been for five years. We uh, my, I got a finance degree, Deanna got an accounting degree, so I went into banking for about two years and was a manager at a bank at. Mm-hmm. 22 years old and then a customer my customer of mine hired me and uh we loved him I and mean, we were friends before when he was a customer of mine and we were friends at work went to church together served together worked off spent more time with him and his family his son who worked with us than my own family yeah and so man yeah it was one of those things he was supposed to retire if he ever did or just you know get out from the day to day i would take his role and his son would do the field stuff right and so really Seth took good, great care of us. And man, we just, I remember one day sitting at my desk and it was in August. I was working on blueprints, doing a takeoff and just thinking there's got to be more than this for me. Then mm-hmm. not that there's anything wrong with it. I loved what sure. I was doing, but God had just created this sense in my heart to where I wasn't satisfied. And it yeah. didn't make sense because I had everything that I should have had needed to be satisfied. Right. And, uh, did you have, I know you had your, your first daughter at that time. Yeah. Had y'all had, had we were Maggie pregnant yet? with Emma. I mean, Maggie, Maggie. Yeah. We, that's were, right. we were just found out we were pregnant with Maggie. Just bought our house in Northport. Uh, I had just helped you move helped into, that move into that house. And we <laughs> couldn't park close cause we had to walk up that hill. So yeah. we had to tow everything up that hill that's cause it was right. too steep for a trailer. You were, I probably have back problems yeah, that, because right? of that, yeah. that one move. And so we, uh, man, it was, uh, and God came knocking and a buddy of mine called me from Thomasville that I never thought I'd work for. And, uh, he called me and said, hey, would you be willing to come work with me? His dad had just passed away and needed some help. The other guy was getting older. And I told him, man, we're in a great position, but I, and I really don't think so. But I always tell people where I messed up is I said, I'll pray about it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Is that's what got me. And I really did. I took it home. I prayed about it. Me and Deanna talked about it. And over about four months, well, I guess it wasn't four months. It was after Thanksgiving. We had decided after talking about numbers, retirement, moving, the logistics, that it was where God wanted us, and it didn't make sense. Mm. And at this point, it was more we knew God was calling us, but we didn't want to do it. And so it was a breaking point for us, and we had to decide what did we really believe. Do we believe God's got our best interest at heart, or do we believe we've got to control the narrative? Mm. And so uh, I went in after we got back from Thanksgiving break and told my boss, hey, we're going to have to move, and this is what's going on. And he asked me to stay through February or through January because yeah. we had a big job we just bid at the DCH hospital. NICU was involved. We were flying units over NICU. That's so a big deal. Insurance and all this stuff was involved, and I said, of course. And so – about two weeks before I left, in the middle of January, he called me in his office and offered me a $10,000 raise starting that day if I stayed. And I told him not to mess with me. 
so, <laughs> because that's what I thought he was doing. And yeah. I, I was stressed because we were trying to sell a house we had just bought. Sure. Been in it for five months, had no equity, trying to figure out living arrangements back home, had a baby due in February, had another daughter already with us. And uh, and so I, I said, man, are you serious? And he said, yeah. And so I, I said, I'll pray about it. Go home and talk to Deanna about it. And so I did. And we sat there, seemed like all night talking at the table. It was probably, you know, a couple of hours. Yeah. And she got up to leave to go check on our daughter. And it was almost, uh, I could almost hear it. I know that she couldn't hear it, but man, God spoke straight to me and he said, are you going to sell out? And I was like, man. And it, the conversation went, after all you've said you believe and after all you've told people and the stands you've taken, you're going to sell out for $10,000. Is that what it's worth? Wow. And I thought, no, because if I look back in five years and I got $10,000, but my life could be completely different because God's calling me to do something. Why would I take the 10 grand now? Yeah. And so I went and found Deanna and I said, we got to go. And I told her what happened, the conversation that I had with the Holy Spirit <laughs> in, our, in our kitchen <laughs> and went back to work the next day and told him, I can't, I can't take the money. Yeah. And he said, you're the only person that I've offered money and they haven't stayed. Wow. And which was affirming to me. It wasn't, I said, it's not that I don't want the money. Sure. It's yeah. just that I've got, God's calling us to do something. And so yeah. that wasn't even called to ministry. That was called to work at a lumber yard. Essentially. Yeah. You just knew. Yeah. He was just calling us. Right. And so we moved to Thomasville. We're there for about a year. Didn't know why God had us there for about six months. And you started helping with local ministry. Yeah. yeah. We just dove in because we, through that process, I felt called to ministry, full-time mm -hmm. ministry, vocational ministry right out of college. Yeah. And just, you and I had that conversation. Absolutely. And so. And you had struggled with it. and Yeah, and struggled with it. And just did. I, I wanted to do what Nick wanted to do. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted sure. to make money. I wanted yeah. to do all that stuff. Just American dream. Like we all do. Yeah. And uh, just didn't. I got a job. That's when I got the job at the construction company because right. I didn't want to be in banking. And I was like, well, this is what God has for us. And it was just one step in the process. And so we ended up uh, through that God. I call it. I did, you know, Joan in the well that a well swallowed me in Tuscaloosa, <laughs> sent me through Thomasville and spit me out in Baldwin County. And then I submitted. Right? And I I've like, never heard you say <laughs> that. I love that. Yeah. It's and great. so that was our process. And so we spent yeah. about 18 months, I guess, in Thomasville working at the, the job wasn't, it wasn't the job. It was me, but it was the worst job yeah. I ever had. Right. And so I just had to look at it as a mission field. And so I just would go every day and try to share the gospel, which was mm -hmm. God just forming that in me. Sure. And uh, they asked me if I was Mormon one time because I was actually out doing what we're supposed to do, yeah. which is kind of an indictment on the church. Totally. <laughs> you know, that we don't, yeah. people, non-believers go, well, if you're sharing the gospel this much, you mm -hmm. must not be a, you, you know, must even, not be a, a you're normal not even Christian. Yeah, yeah, you're not a normal guy. You must be Mormon or Latter-day Saint yeah. or something because they're the ones that do that. Right. And so really convicted me from a church perspective, but made me know I was doing the same, doing the right thing. And yeah. so then, you know, you and I had had conversations. I came down here and visited one Sunday. Blake right. just happened to be here that Sunday. It was his first Sunday. Yes. So I left from there, and we didn't talk for probably eight months. And he called me in May and said some stuff may be happening. And through that, I ended up here. And yeah, was I remember uh, when the conversations began, you know, I, I talked to the elders, and I talked to Blake, and I said, look, man, I'm I'm removing yeah, myself right. from the process. Which was great. Yeah, I love Nick, but you guys are going to have to do this. Well, you know, we want to be really careful about it. And uh, But, man, after praying and interviewing a ton uh, of people. Yeah, it was like I interviewed with everybody twice. Yeah, but we had interviewed <laughs> like, other people, too. Yeah. We had other candidates that wanted to be a part of that. And, uh, man, it, all all the roads just I kept actually, leading us to back end that to you. Story, yeah, to end that story, we actually thought, because it ran out through August. Yeah. Like I said my first Sunday was in September. And Deanna and I, the same, we had sat there. The night before Blake called me, we said, well, if they don't call us, we're just going to go to seminary. I remember First that. of the year. You were headed to Kentucky. Yeah, and we yep. were going to Kentucky, and uh, Blake called the next day. Yes. And said, hey, are you still interested? And we said, yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. It's not going to Kentucky. We'll come. Yeah, <laughs> and then it was an incredible thing, man, because you, I always love how God's always preparing us for what he has prepared for us. And in your sense, you, you had led in the construction right. world. You knew how to lead adults. Yeah. You knew how to men. lead men. 60, 70-year-old men. That's right. You knew how to play, do all of that, which is a unique gifting that you had. So you had a preparation in a way that was right. unique to guys who had not done those yeah. types of things. You've always been organized. You're an organized guy. You're, and and so you brought all those things to bear. And then because of you know uh, your intellect, your natural proclivity to theology and, and intellectual pursuits, yeah. You you began to just absorb. Man. Yeah, I loved it. And, and that's kind like of what, what. Yeah, that's what. Like, you know, when you're working construction, reading Jonathan Edwards' "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God," I, something's not lining up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's two completely. But different. you know, God had given you that. That's hunger. right. Yeah, He gave me that hunger, and so when I finally got into ministry full time as a campus pastor, where I had right. I could use the gift and God had given me, but also learn from you guys. Yeah, 
it was a perfect role for me. And so, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, just, and then I remember you began to teach yeah. and then it became clear. Cause I know for a while there you were like, man, I'm because you had the teaching guy. Yeah. You had such an organizational yeah. side that was so huge, but then it became real clear, real fast that you had a real hunger to communicate, yeah. real hunger to preach. I loved and, it. Grew to love it. Grew to love it and, and, and got better and better, yeah. you know, and, and really did the work. You did the work on the craft of communicating. So before you went to Thomasville, you became a part of the teaching team. You yeah. began to preach on a regular basis at campuses and events. And so, and then you and I had that conversation where, you know, I forget how it all yeah. exactly went down, but I remember thinking he, you know, uh, what do we do with in Thomasville? What's yeah. the next step in Thomasville? And I just threw ro- like right. just rolled the ball out on the floor and I made that same statement. I don't think so, but I'll pray about it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's you messed what, up again. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I think if I understand correctly, uh, Deanna, yeah, your wife was the first one to kind of go. Yeah, she We've was got to think that, about this. We had you know they we had other opportunities, of course, as everybody does when they're working to go and yeah. do other things, and sure. so. You know, just thinking through it, where does God have us? We always thought we'd go maybe small town, yeah. something like that, if we ever left. And then we never thought it'd be Thomasville, mm-hmm. but that just wasn't on our radar. We thought God had really brought us through there the first time as adults to show you us. Thought you thought you were not, done with that, That's right? not where we want you. That's yeah. not where I want you. So we, we said, that's good. That's fine. And then he's, we, you know, you ask us, I said, probably not. We said, we'd pray about it. And Deanna was actually the first one that said, I think that's where he's calling us. Wow. And so then, you know, through a series, through us praying about it, you know, Jordan and I, who was a previous campus pastor yes. there. Had for years just prayed for the community, prayed for the church together because mm-hmm. we had family there. He was obviously pastoring there, had friends there. And uh, again, God just spoke into my heart, how are you going to pray for somebody? Then I call you to go and you're not willing to go. Yeah. And I was just like, well, mm. I guess I'm going. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And now you look back and you go, okay, I see God's hand in all of it that that he brought you here, trained you up yeah. to go back That's right. and yeah. do Makes what sense. you're doing. We couldn't be more excited about what God's doing. We've got a building now, finally, yeah. after all these Coming years. Through. Which, which you huge. you know you guys moving back there became kind of the the linchpin for that and now you know you're building a team you're doing yeah. what you do uh and you are the you know you're the main communicator there you're preaching every week and that brings us to beyond the weekend right. we're, we're so excited about what god's doing in thomasville and we get this you know we're not preaching one another's sermons right. but we do all land on the same kind of landing yeah. pad same of scripture text yeah same text and it's really a cool. I love it. I love I how we're doing it, man. I, I do I enjoy it. And I learn from you, and and you sharpen me, and and hopefully we're all doing that for each other. But you and I have been teaching through Ephesians uh, chapter four, and we we called the series "Tumbleweed" just to help us all kind of stick it to our minds. Right. But you know, Paul tells us, "Don't be blown around by the wind." Um, what do you see, Nick, as you've been preaching through this? How has that challenged not just the church that you preach to, but you as yeah. a man to to get rooted and, and stand strong? Yeah, I think it's been good just across the board. As you preach things, you always learn and you always get convicted. And it's just a realization that we've got a lot of leeway in Scripture in the way that we live our lives. We have a ton of freedom, right? But there's also things that we have to be grounded in. And the truth of that is that God gives us things. That, and a lot of times what we want to do in culture is we want to blow up over certain things where God gives us a lot of freedom, but there's certain things that culture doesn't hold to, and we need to hold to that. Yeah. And so it's really just encouraged me, and I think I hope encouraged our people to know what we believe, because it's the you know for us it's the church, it's the leaders of the church's job to protect the church, the bride of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also our people's job. That it's yeah. not just our job, but the people have to be on defense, defense yeah. also. We're supposed to equip them. Yeah, we're equipping them to do what we do on a smaller level, yeah. and so they've also got to be willing to know what they understand or to know what they believe, yeah. and to understand it and be willing to defend it. Yeah, uh, and and do that on a daily basis, not defend in an aggressive way, mm-hmm. but just to know what they believe. Yeah, and go, be able no, to articulate. Is, that, yeah, this right? is what the gospel is. This right. is what church is for. This is why we do what we do. And so, Absolutely, I, I think the, the winds definitely. He he speaks of a wind that blows against us. Right. And he, one of them is human cunning. I yeah. keep looking at that phrase and I look around me and I see it like the right. winds blowing against our kids, our families, our marriages. W- what do you think Paul meant when he said, watch out for the wind of human cunning? Yeah, I think it, I would say it's when people uh, are just good with words, essentially, and they can, they can frame up a philosophy or ideas in a way that seem appealing hmm. and that they dress it up to, so that we as believers go, well, that's a good idea. Yeah. That makes sense. When you cloak everything in love and you make people feel bad about, you know, well, you don't love them. Well, that makes you go, okay, well, that makes sense. Because we as Christians are supposed sure. to love. It becomes well, very pull, attractive, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, you unzip that and you pull it back and you go, my gosh, there's something different underneath it. Yeah. Well, it's, we've got to know those things so we're grounded in what we should so that people can't fool us. Yeah. As believers. And we can't be, you know, false philosophies and all that stuff. Right. Whether it's sexuality or marriage or what that stuff looks like, how we raise our kids. We've got to be aware. We can't be dumb. You know, Christianity is a very intellectual religion. That we've it is. Got to, 
study and learn. It's not yeah, and God's faith. given us our brains for a for reason, reason, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Use them, you know. <laughs> that's exactly right. And I think that's one of the overall themes of uh, Ephesians chapter four is Paul keeps saying, "You've been, you know, the section you and I preached this past Sunday." He says, "I'm assuming you've heard. Yeah. Like I'm assuming you got the gospel. Right. Then why are you still acting yeah. that way? That's right. Why are you still with our analogy rolling around like a tumbleweed? You have purpose. You have direction. Well, the section we looked at this week that that most of our listeners are probably looking forward to diving into today, uh, Paul begins to use an illustration that's just brilliant, and we all just kind of grabbed it. We're right. like, we can't top what Paul came up with. And he says, hey, I want you to take off the old and put on the new. And one thing, I, I don't know what you did with it, yeah. Nick, but here I said that that, so what we're seeing there is that subtraction actually comes before addition. Yeah. And Jesus said, in order to live, I got to die. Right. I'd love to hear where you went with that. Yeah, so we did. We basically did the same thing. We didn't use the same terminology, but right. we said to say, well, there's some things we got to take off. When we become believers, those are old clothes that we're walking around. And one of my points was that when we become new believers, we're 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 spiritually new. We're made new in our you know we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, made new in Christ. Yeah. But we still got old habits and hangups. We got to get rid of. And so there's still these physical things that we're holding to, whether it's certain types of sin or whatever, that we've got to be willing to take off and lay down. And so that's where we went with it. And then one thing that I added was the idea of I had an old shirt that I had as well that was stained up. You can see through it when you hold it up because okay. it's a shirt I wear at home right. to relax and to work in. That we kind all of have stuff. that yeah, right? soft shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that everybody in the family wants to wear. Your kids want to that's put it right. on you, that kind of thing. And so I had it there. And I said, the problem is that we many times as Christians know this to be true, so we take things off, right? We do the subtraction. But then we add the wrong things when we get t- mm. when we get tired, when we get lazy, when we yes. just want to relax, right? We let our guard down. We go back to these old things that we did when we were living as the Gentiles, right, mm-hmm. as the pagans, that kind of thing, uh, as just unsaved people where we all come from, and we we slowly put that stuff back on. Yep. Well, before we realize it, we've been sitting there for five days binge watching Netflix, you know, with this with these old clothes yeah. on, and we go, man, how did I get here? Right. You know, it's a slippery slope. We say, we've started saying at our campus that following Christ is small steps in the right direction. I love that. And when you look back, you walk two miles. Yep. You know, because people just can't, we don't just start by being able to jump long distances. We've mm-hmm. got to walk that out. And so one thing we talked about this week was how a lot of times we take small steps in the wrong direction as believers. And before long, we're two miles away from Jesus. Yes. And we go, how did this happen? Well, it didn't happen overnight. We slowly put those old comfy clothes back on mm-hmm. and then we started binge watching Netflix, <laughs> you know, and you wake so up. So true. Yeah, man. And you know what is fascinating about it? We we see he's written this to people that he's assuming are Christians. Yeah, it's to, it's the to church. a church. Yeah. So we, this is definitely um, a warning for us yeah. that even with the gospel and the power of the gospel, our flesh is still very, that, right. that current is very strong. Yeah. Um, have you ever struggled with it personally? Do you ever look and go, why am I acting like this? Oh, there's, there's always things that, you know, one of my points was it's a, it's a process, not perfection. Mm. And so we're walking out a process through life and one day mm. we'll be perfect when we mm. die, but we're always going to have these things we struggle with and our personalities and, you know, yes. the way that we're wired are going to tend to lead us more one way than the other. Yep. You know, whether I text one of my buddies, I've got a group of friends that we text back and forth, hold each other accountable, that kind of thing. And one of the questions is, what are you struggling with? And one of the things that I've been struggling with recently is just a positive mindset as far as not with staff or with family, but just with different people who I go, man, they're just not going to get it. Got it. You know, and you want to yeah. give up on people and, and you can't do that, right? As mm-hmm. believers, we're called that there's hope in all things. There's hope in marriages, there's hope in relationships, there's hope there. And so right. we can't just go to a more of an, I, I, I am uh, pessimistic by nature. Okay. And so, oh, I shouldn't say pessimistic. I'm, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I think for? you're more, I, I would I'm optimistic. Know, I'm optimistic. I think optimi- you're realist though. I'm a realist. Knowing you all this time. I'm a realist. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I can be cynical. That's the word I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, I can see that. I'm cynical by nature. And yeah. so I'm optimistic about what I'm doing, <laughs> you know, but then when it comes to what other people <laughs> yeah, are doing, right. I can be very cynical. Do you have a it. hard time trusting people? Trusting I have a hard motives? time. I have a hard time thinking people will get stuff done that I ask them to do. Oh, uh, got it. You know, and so I can trust somebody if I give them like a dollar and go, I can trust you with this, you know, yeah. but then I have a hard time. So it's really, you're going to come through for, for me. you. It's more of a work ethic thing. Yeah. Than, exactly. than character. Yeah. Sense, right? yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. So Paul, interestingly enough, this, the section we looked at this week, it, he kind of goes, Hey, here's what I need you to take off. Yeah. 
and and that doesn't belong anymore. It doesn't fit anymore for your new life. And one of the things he he begins not with the outside behavior change. He begins on the inside. Right. He starts with the mind. He says the Gentiles or lost people have futile minds. And he's saying you don't have a futile mind anymore. Right. You got to stop living that way. W- where did you go with that when you hear that that term futile mind? And then you did your research yeah. and your work. What did you come up with? Man, well, I went where this is it's a mindset that obviously he's writing to Christians, right? He's writing to us pursuing assumed believers he said i assumed you learn christ the way that we teach him uh and the fact that man that it's this turning around to make, or it's this denial to make the right decision and to live the way god wants us to even as believers and i use the illustration of a radio station a fm radio okay. station and so when we are claiming to be believers and we're walking with christ and then we start making decisions that push us in the other direction well the longer we walk in that direction the more static we're going to pick up on the radio and so eventually it's just going to quit picking up. Okay. And so in life, if we stay in that mindset of denying what Christ wants us to do and living uh, the way he wants us in a God-ordained way, uh, then we just get further and further and further away from the radio station to where our mind just goes dark. Mm-hmm. You know, and we go, there's no community. And oftentimes what we want to do is blame God and go, why aren't you talking? Yeah. And the radio station hadn't moved. It's still putting out the same FM frequency it always right. did. What happened was we moved. And so what we have to do is turn around and walk back to Christ when we find ourselves in those situations. Yeah, that's you know, a great illustration. And then it starts man. picking up again. Mm-hmm. As we get closer, you go, mm-hmm. well, now I can hear it more clearly. Yeah, and I love as that. As we keep walking that way, then it continues to get That's why people that are so close to God often are always have just a you know super strong prayer life. Yeah. Because they're walking with God daily, and they're, recept- they're sitting underneath the radio station listening to it. Yeah, I like that. Do you think, you know, when you look at Paul, I think that you and I would agree, he's not saying that someone apart from Christ can't be smart. Right. He's saying a lost person has a futile mind. That doesn't mean a useless mind. Right. Because people without Christ have invented things that we all right. very intelligent. Right. So common grace yeah. that, that we would call it is is very abundant. And, you know, you and I probably uh, take medicines or right. have had procedures that someone who didn't know Jesus invented. Common grace. Sure. So then what is it that sets the Christian mind, Nick, apart from the, the mind apart from Christ? What is it that makes us not futile in our minds? I think it's I think it's the acknowledgement and the hope that we have in it that we are walking in a we're walking in light. I used the illustration this weekend. I used a few that I thought were pretty good, as we yeah. always do, right? Yeah, man. <laughs> we yeah. always think ours is all the, the best. preachers. We love our illustrations. Yeah, and so I, 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 I use the example of somebody you've seen the videos. They always make me cry. I told our people I don't cry; I just get weepy. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Either when I watch babies, you, you know, people know that who know you would not think initially that you're a crier. I do though. Nick, you're a crier. I am. I've you're cried. A crier. <laughs> I cried about all kinds of things <laughs> that I'm, we're not going to talk about here. But yeah. Uh, yeah, and so I use the illustration of what some of those videos that we've all watched are the yeah. ones with uh, the people who are colorblind and they get the glasses. Oh, yeah. They get the glasses and it'll make grown men cry, right? They hadn't seen color for 70 years and they put them on and it just melts them. You used this illustration I used it Sunday? this weekend, yeah. And it, what I was telling people is yeah. people who don't know Christ are walking seeing black and white. Right. And so they, that's just what they've always seen. Wow. But then when we come to know Christ and we walk with him, he's given us those glasses where we can see color. And we go, no, we're describe we're trying to describe the trees and the sky and the grass and all these colors and Man, what people's good. eyes look like. And they're just going, bro, I don't get it. Because they're seeing in black and white. That's a, re- that's a really good way to describe, I think, what Paul was trying to get us to understand there. Yeah. It's not that they can't see. They, they can't can see it in it. color. It's just not they can't coming see. through to Yeah, them. it's not vibrant. Yeah, it's like, no, that's a beautiful sunset. And they're like, all I see is kind of some grayish clouds and uh-huh. some bright color, but I don't know what color it is. Yeah. And we're going, no, wow. it's orange and red and yellow and, right. you know, the Amazing. water's kind of blue. <laughs> that's what, that. yeah, that's that's what he meant by that. Because they're seeing it. They're smart. They're intelligent. Uh-huh. They're doing things. Good people. Right. Oftentimes, I, I said here at at, th- at uh, the Fairhope campus that um, the the lack of futility in our minds means that we we get how, why, how it all fits together. Yeah, like we understand there's a creator who created this, so right. we don't just look at a mountain range. We go, well, we know who made that. We don't right. glorify the creation; sense. we glorify the creator. He then so the other things he says the ne- all internal first before he goes to our outside behaviors. The next thing he says is uh, watch out for uh, not hardness of heart, but the the next one was the spiritual vitality. Yeah. He says they are alienated from the life of God. Yeah. Okay, obviously when he said that he doesn't mean physical life because they're alive. What's what does he mean by that? What yeah. is life of God? I said hope again. I went okay. back. I said hope that yeah. it's just this, that we as believers have a hope people don't understand. Yeah, and so even the most optimistic non-believer is going to have times where they just don't get it, and it's mm-hmm. just depressing. And so I think what he's yeah. talking about there is just this hope that we are able to walk in mm-hmm. that others can't. 
They just they don't yeah. see it. They can't see the color. Wow, they can't see point. the beautiful, you know, the the sunset that we're looking at. And they just go, well, it's mm-hmm. just the same gray and grayish thing I always look at. Yeah. And we're going, no, dude, it's different. So hope is the, That's the what I, distinctive. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that would be very Pauline because, you know, you and I have probably used a bunch when we do funerals. We all often go to that verse where yeah. he says, we grieve too as Christians, but we grieve with hope. We grieve with hope. We have a distinctive. Right. The last thing he says internally, he goes, mind, I, I saw spiritual vitality in life of God as our soul. Right. And then that last piece, he says, hardness of heart. Callous. You get into the Greek there, and the idea is literally past feeling. Mm-hmm. You don't feel it anymore. Yeah. Um, what'd you do with that? I said, too, I was talking about how when we become callous, I said, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but pleasure fully ob- fully obtained seeks to please. Yeah. The more pleasure that we have, it just makes us more and more callous toward mm-hmm. it. We've got to get almost like a drug addict. We've got yeah. to get more and more. Yeah. And, this, and sin is the same way. And so I use the illustration of sugar. If you've mm-hmm. ever cut sugar out of your diet, it's hard to do and you cut it out. But then once you cut it out, you get one cookie and you're like, man, that's super sweet. Sweetest you can't hardly handle it. Yeah. Drink so, water for a month and then have a Coke. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll wreck you. Blow your mind. It'll wreck you. Yeah, yeah. but when we're when we always eating sugar, yeah. then you go, man, so I need true. some sugar in the morning. I need pancakes. You with become syrup. desensitized. You do. And so right? need, you need more. You need it after lunch. You need it for snacks. Right. And so, and that's what I was talking about. As we become callous, our senses become more numb, mm-hmm. that we crave it more and more and more. But as believers, when we walk with Christ and we begin to, to lessen, they're just like cutting sugar, we cut. The, we take the layers off, as we're going to talk about, yep. one at a time. Well, then sin becomes super sensitive. Yeah. And the, the the little things start to go, well, man, that just hit me different. Like the joke that you normally think is bu- funny when your buddy tells you, you go, man, that was borderline like inappropriate. Yeah. You, you used to laugh at it, but sure. because you're walking closer to Christ, yeah. those things bother you more. And I was, and it's a process. It is a process. I was listening to our Nick showed me, our youth guy showed me a podcast somebody was on recently, and they were talking about how because they walk so close to Christ, they use foul language and all this stuff, and it doesn't matter. Mm. Well, it's just a false yeah, doctrine because the yeah. closer you get to Christ, the more you become like Christ and the more that those things hurt you and, yeah. and the more sensitive you are to them. I totally agree with that, man. You become more sensitive. Yeah. Um, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, yeah. you begin to feel it. Right. You know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Paul, funny enough, the last thing he does is goes to the outside and he says, hey, heart, soul, mind. And then he says, we got to stop. I think he said that without Christ we are greedy to do more every sinful thing. Yeah. yeah. We just wanna we want to go as far as we can. We yeah. see that in our culture right, right now, right? Yeah. You just you can't get enough of it. Can't get enough. And I like I started with hard of hearts because in one commentary that I read it was saying that hey, that's what produces the rate. They're all mm-hmm. a symptom of a hard heart is no, where it good. starts. Yeah. And so that's just another one playing out to where you just do more and it's kinda mm-hmm. like the sugar thing. You do more and more and more. And totally. you just you get and that's the people you see it in a lifestyle that you go, man, how does this it doesn't make any sense. Like, how do you get there? Well, when you when you commit sin and you continue to live contrary to God, well, then your mind gets darkened, your heart gets hard, right. you become calloused, and so you can't make good decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, because you just go, man, that doesn't make any people in deep sin. It's like the pastor recently that was tragic. Very you know, tragic. He didn't start there. Yeah, he didn't start there. there he started. Could, there's a trail, right? There's a trail, and it started with small steps in the wrong direction, and that's where he ended up because he just got hard. His, his heart just got his mind got darkened. He thought there were no repercussions. He become yeah. more calloused. You know, all those things that Paul warns us about. Yeah, and he just walked it out. One example mm-hmm. of many of pastors that are friends that we know that have fallen from. Yeah, and that they want you know the the phrase that seems to be so uh, prodigious is you know I don't know how I got here. Yeah, it's like well the Bible does tell us there's a trail, yeah, right? Man, right. There's breadcrumbs. Yeah, there's breadcrumbs that that yeah totally we walked out. And then so so the idea of Paul's like hey. you too many of us, I think he was saying to the Ephesians, you put on Christ. You forgot to take off this right. other stuff. Yeah. Let's go back and take some of that stuff You're off. Layering it. You're layering it, which is cool <laughs> in a cold weather, but God <laughs> right. doesn't want that. He yeah. wants it gone. And and so we got to do the subtraction. Jesus said that over and over. You got to die to live. You got to pick up your cross if you're going to follow me. We all want to run to the follow me part and carry our old yeah, life bring with, it us. with us. Yeah. But, you know, I, th- I think, Nick, the reason we often don't is because it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to lay down the old life. Well, I think we like it a little yeah. bit, don't we? Yeah. And that was one of the things that I'm, one of the points I made earlier as we were setting up this whole teaching on Sunday is that as believers, we have to be okay with living different. Yeah. Because it's going to be hard. And there's going to, those old friends, the old Gentiles, as Paul says, that we used to hang out with, that they're still Gentiles, they're still going to be living the same way. And at some point, there's going to become pressure points in your relationship where you go, I just can't do that anymore. I just can't go there anymore. Yeah. Or the invites quit coming because now you've got a different worldview. You've got, you're seeing through color and not black and white. Right. 
because you got those lenses on that show you color now through the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit. And so things change, and you've got to be okay with that. And it's hard. It makes it tough. Yes, it Especially does. when it's comfortable, where you've been there forever. That's been your group forever. Yeah. That's been your thing forever. Or our habits. I, I, yeah. I know that, you know, it's it's astounding to me how uh, your habits become kind of your comfort zone. Yeah. This is how I do. This yeah. is how I live. This is how I walk. This is how I talk. This is how I react to certain things. And Jesus just blows that up, doesn't he? He yeah. just gets in the middle of that, like, no, nope, that's, that's not who hard, you are man. now. And it's even for me, it's little things like, man, I love to laugh. Yeah. And I like to make, and I like, I think I'm funny. I may not be, right? I like to think I am. <laughs> you and I both like to clown around <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, you get around the right type of buddies that you've known forever. You start yeah. telling jokes. It can get out in left sure. field pretty quick. But yep. if it's rolling, a lot of times you just roll with it. And that's, you know, and, it's, and everybody's dying laughing. And then you get done and you go, boy, we shouldn't have went there, you know, and you get convicted yeah, about it. talk. Yeah, that. it's hard. And that's what Paul talks about. It's and, you know, in the, in the following verses in chapter five, but the next on my mm-hmm. column, I think through how my Bible looks and it's the left page, gotcha. right column. Yep. But he talks about the way that we talk and the coarse yeah. jokes that we make. Yep. That's coming this next week. You yeah. Because well, he's really going to detail what the new uniform looks like, right? right. The yeah. New clothing, and putting so. that stuff, which is equally hard. You know, it's equally hard, challenging, uh, but brings such such great joy yeah. to the Christian life. Um, man, so, man, I, I, it sounds like you had a great time just like we did, just walking it's through the series. It's always fun learning this stuff and teaching yeah. it. One thing I thought was interesting, and I, I want to say it here because I thought it was interesting. Okay. And you probably have said this, but the fact of, obviously, Paul was writing to the church. Yeah. Right? And so the church, the commentaries that I read said was most likely planted by Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, Aquila, yeah. The other two got the other, killed. The others are dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wrong group. Aquila wrong, Priscilla. Wrong married couple. <laughs> right, right. Two drastically different uh, stories. Yeah, we, yeah. Uh, and so it was planted. Notice I agreed with you in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was it, Nick. So at least we corrected <laughs> it. Aquila and Priscilla planted it. Paul pastored it. Timothy went back and pastored it. Yeah. Then, then uh, they say that's where John was when he got arrested right. to go to the island of Patmos. Then he goes to the island, right, has the vision, revelation. Uh, but one of the churches that he talks about was the one that lost his first love, which was the church at Ephesus. It's crazy. And so they had this super st- historical, strong mm-hmm. founding, right? That's the right. foundation was strong. But yet they lost their first love of reaching yeah, they, people with the gospel. They had a superstar staff for a yeah, long time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And you have anybody, and it's a short period of time, like 30 years or whatever mm-hmm. it was that John went to the island. They had the Jesus. best Bible teachers ever. Ever, ever. We're still studying them. That's a good point. You no, know, I did not bring that out Sunday. That's a that's a great point. And the one in Revelation, they're the one that lost their first yeah. love of the gospel. It can happen. Anybody. It can happen. If it can happen to them, it can happen to anybody. Tumbleweed. There's tumbleweed individuals, but if we're not careful, we'll be a tumbleweed church. Yeah, that's we'll right. We'll go wherever Pushed the around. wind blows. Yep. With false philosophies and doctrines. Oh, man. And, and, they, and those winds are going to keep blowing. Yeah. they ch- got to be ready. Satan uses the same thing. He just renames it. And no doubt. Blows the other way. Because it keeps working. Yeah. So I want to land the plane today, Nick, because we've kind of got a... You know, of course, what's happening in Thomasville is awesome. And we think over the next three to five years, we're going to see some incredible things happen. Facilities, all that's just going to be tools for the impact that's going to happen. But I know that for years, you've had a vision that we're going to formalize here at Three Circle. Not only are you the campus pastor of the Thomasville campus and on the teaching team, you're going to be our director of rural ministries. And you have a huge heart for that yeah. um, because what you and I want to I want you to kind of tell just for a few moments your vision for that and how three circles being going to be a part of it. Uh, but you've done some research yeah. about where people actually live and where ministries are needed. Right. And it happens to, of course, we care about urban. We're going to be a part sure. of that as well. Uh, Micah Gaston, uh, our Midtown Campus pastor, is going to run that part of what we do. But talk to us about the vision sure. for the rural ministry. Sure. And so, uh, you know, Thomasville is a rural town of about 3,500 people. you got the county that's outside of that that brings more people in. And so I think I, I did a radius study recently that said in, in 40 miles there was 80,000 people. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's pretty. there's yeah. people out there. Sure. You just don't see them because they're not on the highway. Right. And so there's people out there that aren't involved in church. You think about a, an area like Clark County that's, you know, what you would think is in the middle of the Bible Belt. A lot of people go to church. They really don't. I mean, you got churches yeah. running two, three hundred, maybe. Well, most that's a them, huge church. Yeah, that's a big area. church. And then most of them run maybe 50 to 70. Uh-huh. There's some between 100 and 200, but not a lot of people in church. And uh-huh. so. Well, what we found is there's a lot of people, obviously, that just generationally don't go to church. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who have been burnt by church. Yes. There's a lot of people who think church is a place where it's just a hard gospel, where there's not a lot of forgiveness and a lot of grace. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so what we want to do is we go, Hey, that's, you know, if you do a church, we're not about style. We don't want to change the style that people, we have a certain style at three circle the way we do church, yeah. but we're not against traditional churches. And that's not against, our thing. That's not our, yeah, that's yeah. not our thing. And so we're not about that. We just want to bring healthy churches to areas yes. for the people who aren't going to go to the traditional church where they grew up with. And so uh, statistically I would have brought it if I'd have known I needed it, but, uh, the large group. I didn't set you up. For <laughs> you, did, you didn't set me up with this exact quote. But, but I mean, you and I have talked There's about a it. large portion of people. We always focus inner city, but there's a large there's a large portion of America that lives in, in rural America That's right. and nobody's going. And so uh, they say it's an unreached mission field because uh-huh. people are, people just assume they already have churches. There's a lot of assumptions made that don't, that aren't true about rural communities. Addictions high, uh, marriage, divorces yes. high, all those things. Statistically, you look at an inner city and go, that's why we need churches in inner cities. The which same which is we true. agree with. Yeah. 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 It's the same is true for rural, rural communities. Wow. And so we just don't have people going because of the context, because it's not, it's not close to anything. It's, yep. you know, it's their inner city ministry and rural ministry is very much like more than people think. Yeah. Because more, they're unique. They're unique. There's gatekeepers in both communities. Uh-huh. There's people you can't, you're not trusted if you're not from there. There's a lot of high walls. Uh, that make it hard ministry mm-hmm. to do. We're in a place like, I mean, Fairhope's obviously got its challenges, Daphne, but there's a, there's fluidity in people. That's right. They come and go. People move from all fast over the growing, country, fast growing. So if a church pops up, they go, that makes sense. Yeah. But in a small town where their population stagnant at best, for something new to happen and a new church to come in. It's suspect. It's suspect. Yeah. And so for the people who, you know, aren't tied into a church who their family hasn't been going there forever, a lot of times it's hard for them to get engaged. And yeah. one thing that's been a blessing for us is we had somebody – come in recently and said, we love that you guys met us in the parking lot as soon as we got here. It's just little things, you Absolutely. know, that we want to be a life-giving church. And they go, you know, it, it doesn't matter your background here. We just come and worship together. Mm-hmm. And so we want to preach a gospel of one thing that we say is, or like to say on, on Sundays is we don't look back at who we were, but who God wants us to be. Yeah. And so, you know, because a lot of times in small town, everybody knows your story. Yeah, right. Everybody knows where you come from. And so there's a lot of stuff that can be held over your head for 20, 30 years. Jesus can rewrite the Yeah, story. and so we go, man, Jesus can rewrite that, then we don't want to talk about it. We mm. know, we all know what happened, but it doesn't matter because now you're a new person working for a new purpose. And uh, we want to see that man, kind I of stuff. I love that. I love it. We got to, I just can't you, that. Yeah, <laughs> write that down. <laughs> but what I love, Nick, is that you, you're you doing, you're a practitioner, what you're doing in Thomasville, you have a vision to help other right. people yeah, do. We, yeah. And we don't care if our name's on it, right? right. We yeah. just, it's kingdom work. Yeah. But we want to become a church that helps other Thomasvilles happen right out all there. over the South, yeah. all over America. That's right. Be a blueprint and yeah. just go, hey, this is what worked for us. This is what right. we did. This is how we engage the community. Yeah. And just help people with that. And even, you know, at some point, we're not a multi, we don't want to be a multi site campus. We're a multi site church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then if there's people that come to us from, you know, a, a church an hour away and we go, and they go, how are you guys doing this? Yeah. And we you go, help hey, them. yeah, we'll go, hey, we'll help you. Like, we'll give you anything we got. Absolutely. We'll tell you any secrets we have or whatever. Yeah. And, and help you with that. So we want to help. It can be done. A lot of times, rural ministry is overlooked as it can't be done. People are hard headed. They don't move. They don't move, but they need, they need Jesus. Yeah. I read a good book recently called Small Town Jesus by a guy named Donnie Griggs, I think, and uh-huh. he's in a small town in North Carolina. And he just hits on that how it's a misnomer that, you know, we can do ministry in urban areas and it trickle down to the inner city. Well, what people don't realize is that when people in the inner city is making fun of the country people, the country people are making fun of the inner city people. <laughs> and that stuff doesn't trickle like they think. Yeah. Because they go, we don't want it. If we wanted it, we'd move there. That's There's a, guys that you could right. never get to move to Fairhope that we uh-huh. do ministry with because they don't want it. Yeah, and you're and, and we're right to there. I, absolutely, I I am so excited about where that's going to head. I, I'm excited about what's happening in Thomasville, Nick, and I'm excited about what's going to happen uh, in a more in an even more extensive way through the vision for the rural side of what we're going to do. It's exciting. A lot of great things happening. Yeah, and uh, I think Can we keep I think talking. The, yeah, I know. <laughs> But I do, I, I do know over the next couple of years, you know, you're gonna, you're probably gonna write a book about this. I'd love to, yeah. You're probably gonna start a podcast, and we want to, con- you know, we want to see a three circle conference one day. We're awesome. at that conference, you know, there's a part of it that's going to be talking about suburban, yeah. urban, and also rural. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Where we're hopefully guys from all over the country are coming and going. Hey, we want to do that. How do y'all do both? How do y'all let's, do all of it? Let's you've do that. Urban, you've got rural, yeah. you've got people or people. What would let's you call the Eastern Shore? Urban? I, oh, uh, not, no, no, suburban. No, not, yeah, suburban. this is suburbia. Yeah, this is uh, down the middle suburbia America. Yeah. It's growing like crazy. Right. You know, and, you, and you could consider like the downtowns of Daphne, Fairhope, Spanish Fort, maybe more urban. It's that hybrid, but really I think it's suburban yeah, America. Yeah, suburban. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think Midtown is our truly urban campus. Yeah. The Midtown campus. 
Um, where it's you, beautiful though, right? It's the, one of my points that we've been talking oh, about yeah, unity diversity. and diversity. The diversity is what makes us beautiful. Oh my gosh. Our unity is around the gospel, which makes us strong. Yeah. And so, yeah. And I think under the same kind of canopy, we're all coming at this from different angles, but it's so cool to see a guy like you have a heart for this, yeah. like in, and want to go and chase it. And so we just want to keep putting wood on that fire. That I'll guys keep, already I'll keep put inside it. of you. Keep burning keep it. Keep sending it all burning. <laughs> well, guys, I hope all of you who joined us today have, hopefully, you enjoyed going a little deeper into the sermon and hearing Nick's story. He's got one of my favorite stories. I'm so proud of him as my brother and my friend. But we love what God's doing in Thomasville. We cannot wait uh, to see all that's going to happen through that and the rural side of what we're doing be at exciting. Three Circle. Um, absolutely. And, uh, hey, if you're with us, you might be listening in the Thomasville area, Clark County and those surrounding areas get to the thomasville campus you absolutely love it and then wherever you are whatever you're going through we hope that today we've stirred your affection for christ we hope that you'll turn this podcast off and be encouraged to follow him to love him to learn of him and uh, and we hope you'll join us this weekend at a three circle campus near you it starts on thursday night here on the eastern shore sunday everywhere including nick's campus in thomasville and this podcast will drop next week at the same time we hope to see you here again here at the Three Circle Podcast.